everyone. <laughs> I'm watching people wander in. Come on in, grab a seat. We'll try to stay on our schedule. We're pretty, pretty tightly scheduled, so I don't want to waste too much time. I am Deidre McDonald Berzer. I'm the director of the South Dakota Historical Society Press, and it is my great honor to welcome you all to an in-person gathering of this South Dakota State Historical Society annual history conference. The last time we were able to do this in person was 2019. So does that seem like an eternity ago? Yeah, <laughs> pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, but here we are, and um, Really excited to be here. I became the director of the press in October of 2020, and I feel like this conference has been a central part of my work ever since. So it's, it's kind of surreal to finally see it um, as a reality and that it's kind of taking place. I'm gonna um, take a moment to thank my staff, Cody Ewart, Jennifer McIntyre, Abby Wright, Sarah Dozier. Um, they have had a central focus on this conference as much as I have, and so here we are. I also want to thank Pinnacle Productions, who did all of our setup and doing our sound and um, live streaming, so hello to our live stream audience. And that's a new thing in this post-pandemic world as well, to do these hybrid events. And also want to thank the Ramcoda setup and catering crew. And now I, it is my great honor to introduce our state historian and the director of the South Dakota State Historical Society, Dr. Ben Jones. And he has been the director since December of 2020. He earned his PhD at the University of Kansas and spent 23 years in the Air Force. A couple of different times he was assigned to teach at the United States Air Force Academy. He also ran logistics in Afghanistan. I'm sure there are stories there, <laughs> lots of stories. He is the author of Eisenhower's Guerrillas with Oxford University Press. And so World War II is really central to his um, historical training. And he's gonna kind of help us kick off thinking about what it means to uh, fight a good war and um, for South Dakota especially. And I love to hear from him when he's been to the archives, which are you know, just down from his office because he gets so excited, he finds these gems and um, tells us all about them. And so I think in the years to come, we have a lot of things to learn about South Dakota history from our state historian, Ben Jones. Thank you so much for being here. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it is great to be here and great to be in person after uh, the pandemic is, is uh, waning. And um, thanks for your attendance, both uh, in person and those on virtual and online, uh, for fighting the good war, South Dakotans, in World War II. Uh, despite the question mark still hitting us about the pandemic, it's good to see that uh, the, the participation is what it is. It's especially good to have uh, our sponsors here, and I'd like to uh, thank them specifically the Acta Lakota Museum and Cultural Center, the Black Hill State University Veterans Legacy Project, the Center for Western Studies, Delta Dental, First Dakota Bank, uh, author Sarah Herbert, the Heritage Store, the South Dakota National Guard Museum, the South Dakota Archives, the South Dakota Humanities Council, the South Dakota Public Broadcasting, artist Jim Pollock, the Trail of Governors, and uh, the West River History Conference that's celebrating its 30th year. Uh, a round of applause for all these folks for their support. Uh, the West River uh, is, like I said, celebrating its 30th year, and I'd like to take a moment to uh, recognize that uh, SHPO, the State Historic Preservation Office, led by Ted Spencer, SHPO is in its 50th year this year with the legislation that, from the federal legislation that came about in the um, late 60s, and that uh, the press is celebrating its 25th year uh, this year. And I, I'd also like uh, a round of applause for, for Deidre and her team, her mighty team, Jennifer, Cody, Abby, and Sarah for putting this conference together. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, as noted, the conference offered, uh, or we wanted to offer this virtual option this year, and while we'd love to have you uh, here in Pier, we know that many people uh, require the flexibility. And as the snowstorm gathers over the western part of the state, you might start 
in person and, and virtually. I don't know how that will go, but that might be an option. We know that in the end of the day, flexibility is the key to a lot of this, and uh, we're, we're glad to offer that. So we will hope to continue that option in the future for all of you. Uh, and it's not that we don't want people to come. We just want people to be able to participate in whatever venue that uh, works best for them. One of our goals in the Historical Society is to make uh, the, our quality history more accessible to all, hence uh, our commitment to in-person and virtual attendance. Also, to support that goal, we've refurbished our monthly book presentation, and we now call it History Talks, and we look forward to continue that, bringing you that, uh, those author presentations in person and online. Uh, and also with something we started last July that I hope you've heard about is our new podcast, History 605. I interview authors and curators, preservationists, and other scholars on their work and their books, their museum exhibits, and so forth, and how they put their uh, research together and have told the story that they've told. It's done with uh, great support from the foundation and also in a partnership with South Dakota Public Broadcasting. So upcoming history talk schedules can be found uh, often the word is spread in newsletters, uh, newsletters from the foundation. And History 605 can be found on whatever podcast uh, venue or platform you might use, uh, or the SDPB website. Uh, we even have History 605 t-shirts just out the door there, so you, I hope you uh, get a chance to pick one of those up. Um, I wanted to bring you up to date on the building renovation for our, uh, the, cultural historic, uh, or, uh, the Cultural Heritage Center. Last spring, Governor Noem asked her cabinet and staff to submit ideas that under our current budget uh, situation could take advantage of uh, that situation and have a generational impact. And so I got busy with the museum staff and we came up with a list of needs, turned out to be a very long list of needs, uh, for the building and uh, that's, uh, that was completed in 1989. Uh, on April 7th, we had our first meeting with Secretary Sanderson, the Commissioner of uh, Buildings and Grounds and the Bureau of Administration and the State Engineer and discussed the Cultural Heritage Center's uh, potential projects and so forth. Uh, the archives and the museum staff were telling me from the minute I walked in the door that uh, we are running out of room and that they expected, given the, even with pretty stern collection policies, that uh, we would be out of room in four years. Our, our archive storage and our museum storage would be zeroed out. Uh, subsequent research and a lot of math revealed that at the pace that we collected stuff in the archives, which is 325 cubic feet a year. If you think about history consumption rates in cubic feet, if you go from the thought to the physical presence in the archives, it consumes 325 cubic feet of material every year. And if we kept up going at that pace, we'd be out of room in four years. So we knew we had to do something with that. And uh, a lot of other uh, buildings, um, uh, regular repair and maintenance and so forth, pest control, uh, and even the carpet is still the original carpet from 1989, needed a lot of upkeep. And so... We made a proposal and uh, the governor approved and she put it in her budget request and it, uh, uh, as a spending bill, it received no, no votes. So a double make negative makes a positive. The bill passed and uh, the money arrived in my account this week. So we will, um, uh, the Designer is, is ISG from Sioux Falls, and this week we named the um, contractor uh, management at risk who will manage the, the construction of the project for us, uh, and that is McGuff Construction of Sioux Falls. And so we're very excited about that. The staff is um, looking forward to having a new building and looking forward to grinning and bearing through the renovation process as we figure out how to um, do our job while we're kind of half closed and so so forth in different parts of the project. But we don't know the dates of when we will um, begin the renovation, and we don't know the dates of when we might open and close and this kind of thing yet, but uh, stay tuned for the word on that. Um, I, I think a pro tip, though, if you have research to do in the archives, I would do it before September 1st, just a planning factor. 
Uh, now to the conference we have in store for you. Uh, the theme for this year centers on the events that's certainly known for its global scale, but we thought that with all the 80th anniversaries coming up from the very crowded year of 1942, it would be a good time to take a look at this global context, uh, conflict from a state and local perspective. 16 million Americans served in the war. 407,000 Americans died while in service. 79,000 became prisoners of war, or became missing, and 672,000 suffered non-fatal wounds in the Second World War. In all of that, sometimes it's hard to see how a small state like South Dakota fits in. But it's not hard if you look. And today and tomorrow, we'll be afforded the opportunity, a really wonderful opportunity, to see how South Dakotans served in a wide variety of ways. In all, South Dakota saw 68,000 serve in the military and approximately 2,400 uh, were, were lost in the war in combat or combat-related deaths. With such a large pool of people, interesting connections or ironies can emerge. Uh, examples range from Don Smith and Henry Potter, who flew Doolittle's Raiders dropping the first bombs in Japan 80 years ago this week, to Ernest Lawrence from Canton, who worked on the Manhattan Project developing the last bombs that would be dropped on Japan. Medal of Honor recipient Joe Foss for shooting down 26 Japanese planes and Japanese-American Kenny Higashi who served in the Gopher Broke 442nd Regimental Combat Team. We're highlighting some of these stories during the conference, but also sharing aspects of the rich and growing research opportunities that researchers and the general public still have about the different oral histories, archival holdings, and to get a sense of how the war impacted those who remained in South Dakota. You'll even get a first uh, ever uh, chance to, do, to witness a live History 605. Uh, I've never done one of those, and you'll be the first in the audience, so we'll see how that goes. Um, a couple comments about the conference's title. Uh, after publicizing Fighting the Good War, one follower on social media said something to the effect that there's no such thing as a good war. And while I know people like Marcella LeBeau, a combat nurse, could attest that her combat experiences are mostly examples of humans at their worst. It's worth noting that the American people didn't want war, spent the 1920s and 30s negotiating arms treaties to avoid it, and after the United States was attacked, prosecuted the war that ended a European genocide and countless war crimes in Asia. Coming home after the war, their examples of service furthered civil rights. And in recognizing the service and accomplishments of native sons and daughters as John Little, and Sean Flynn and Donovan Sprague will share with us. And Lauren Harris also teaches us with a wonderful example of her new book on Kenny Higashi, that the war was good in its furthering the certain unalienable rights for all of us. Because in one particular aspect of American life, there is no more worthy argument that such service has consistently led for the expansion of civil rights and equal opportunity. And whether it was civil rights in 1963 or the opportunities afforded to the GI Bill that put 8 million uh, veterans through college and their technical education. So if stopping horrendous mass murder and then coming home and making your country even better than it was before isn't good, I don't know what is. So I hope you enjoy fighting the good, wo good war. I know I will. Thanks for coming. We're actually ahead of schedule, look at us. Okay. <laughs> so, Donovan, are you ready? A little early? Okay, great. Um, I am so pleased to introduce Donovan Sprague. He teaches history at Sheridan College. He's the author of 10 books on Lakota, Dakota, Nakota, and Crow history. And if you're interested in those, you can ask him about them. He is a descendant of Fort Pier founders. Black Buffalo and Fred Dupuis. And he, I think he's a descendant of 
I think every time I meet him, he tells me who other people he's descended from. So <laughs> it's a wonderful, exciting family tree he has. Today, he will share with us a presentation on his dear friend, Marcella LeBeau, pretty rainbow woman of Cheyenne River. Please help me welcome Donovan Sprague. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for the introduction there, and I'm very pleased to be here and appear today uh, with the History Conference, and uh, very happy to be here to share some information about my friend, a uh, pretty rainbow woman, we called her, Marcella LeBeau. Uh, so with, um, I want to start with uh, a, uh, some of her early um, history here and beginnings. She was from the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation and uh, she had just uh, accepted an, a national award uh, like days before she passed in this past November. Uh, but Marcella was born in 1918 on Cheyenne River at Promise, South Dakota. She was a member of the Ohoya Numpa Lakota and uh, that's one of the seven bands of the, of the Lakota who are not as well known. Translates to uh, Two Kettle Band, of which there are four of the seven Lakota bands at Cheyenne River. So she was very proud of that too, and she was very proud of the fact that the Ohoya Numpa uh, were not you know, as recognized as some of the others. In fact, uh, her one of her uh, dis relatives there was uh, mislabeled as an Ogallala, as one of the signers of the 1868 treaty over at Fort Laramie in 1868. So I want to share some of her uh, beginnings and her legacy and, uh, you know, some of the, her uh, events that happened in World War II. Uh, so her parents were were uh, Joseph Ryan and Florence Forbear Ryan. It was through her, uh, on her mother's side of the family, that she went into the Hunkpapa Lakota, which is uh, like our neighbors to the north of Cheyenne River at Standing Rock. And uh, that individual was the famous uh, Chief Rain in the Face, who was also a veteran of the Battle of the Little Bighorn, of some of the Bozeman Trail Wars, like the at Fort Phil Kearney, the Fetterman fight. Uh, so her family, very much, uh, you know, veterans of, of many things. And so today we call all of our people veterans. So I come from a long line of, of veterans, even, you know, back in the 1700s, 1800s. Uh, so sometimes we focus on those that just aligned with the United States of America. But our men and women have been warriors for a long time serving in, in many of those uh, episodes. And Marcella, as my friend, always liked to talk about that stuff. So today I want to talk about some of the things that she loved to talk about as well. So uh, she, along with um, three brothers and one sister, attended a one-room country school at Promise. Uh, two years after her mother died, um, her grandmother, Louise Bareface also passed away. That uh, Her, her uh, mother passed when she was 10 years old, and uh, that's when she received uh, Louise's Lakota name, which is Pretty Rainbow Woman. And so that was her Lakota name, and I see that name is still being uh, pass, passed along in the family. Uh, Marcella recalled that when, when she got her name, she got a, a raspberry colored shawl, very bright, she remembered that. And back then there were no ceremonies like that are done today for name giving because uh, during the early reservation period a lot of the uh, practices were actually outlawed. So 
things like the, well, the Sundance and um, different ceremonies you could not do. So they just didn't do those, but they, they in their heart, you know, they had a, a lot of feeling behind all that. So uh, Marcella graduated from high school. Um, she went to a boarding school at St. Elizabeth School Mission in Wakpala. Uh, and then to Pierre. So she had lots of roots here in Pierre, South Dakota. Um, a memory of her uh, mother in the hospital when she was caring for her uh, really inspired Marcella to, um, to go into health and nursing and, uh, as, a, as a career. So she attended nurses training at, at Pierre under the Benedictine Sisters. Uh, received her diploma in nursing at St. Mary's Hospital in Pierre in 1942. Uh, her first jobs after graduation were at Fort Thompson, where she got into the Indian Health Service Hospital, and then also to uh, Pontiac, Michigan as a, as a RN. So I wanted to... Uh, give you a little more of the, of the roots of, of the area too. So um, promise early beginnings here. Um, a lot of these places are underwater from the Wahi Dam. So we used to talk a lot about some of the, the foundations and some of the early history there. So if you could picture some of the Arikara Indian villages and that up and down the, the Missouri River, that was very common to, to that area. Um, so LeBeau came from, from uh, of their family member, Anton LeBeau. So that's the, the French connection. He comes from Quebec down to St. Louis, down to uh, Missouri River, establishes a, um, a, a community there. And so some of these early communities was actually like a forebear camp. And then you have uh, LeBeau, and then there was also Everts. So anybody from uh, Mobridge, like these communities were south of there on the east bank of the Missouri River. So uh, some of them, like LeBeau, would, would uh, transfer over. Uh, they, they moved to the other side. So um, I can talk more about some of the, the roots here, but uh, I mentioned Mobridge there and then the Missouri River. And then, of course, you have the, the old Fort Bennett to the south was the headquarters of the Cheyenne Agency. And so this would kind of make a move up to the, to the north, um, especially to uh, where, like on 212, where the Gettysburg, the bridge is there, and the Cheyenne Agency that come in. And then, of course, that being claimed by the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineer and then the, the Oahe Dam ahead of that. Um, so with, with this whole community, it was during Marcella's time period, it was very much a farming community. And that sounds kind of unusual for Lakota who were known as uh, like nomadic horsemen and following the buffalo and that. But there was a lot of settle, settlement there and it was a result of the 1887 Allotment Act. An allotment would give 160 acres to tribal members to, to farm, basically, and have their own area. So this is a postcard over at uh, LeBeau, where a homestead was. And then the other picture is, a, is, is postmarked from over there. Uh, this is early 1900s. And I also have, I didn't have a chance to locate them, but I, I do have some... Uh, several letters of my own family that are postmarked from uh, uh, 18, uh, like in 99 and early 1900s. They've got Everts and LeBeau and actually then Timber Lake on them as well. And so um, a lot of Marcella's families kind of 
intersect with with my people in in at least with my band and so uh, I'm from the Minikoju Lakota which was more uh, western part of the reservation and um, some some of our family from there were the leaders uh, hump and crazy horse touch the cloud spotted elk also known as uh, uh, Bigfoot so um, all of those connections come into here and um, Another connection too, like we, Marcel and I would talk about them coming down from like Anton LeBeau from Quebec and all those families were in the same area I found out up around Montreal. Of course they came from uh, Paris first and then over to Montreal and I found these uh, routes down to towards St. Louis, some of them going across to uh, communities in Illinois where some of these families would stay over for maybe a year or two or and then go on eventually to St. Louis. There was uh, quite a bit of activity for a few years around Council Bluffs, Iowa. We found family names in the, in the present uh, cemeteries there. Finally up towards the Yankton and then on up the the, the river that way, but uh, my great-great-grandfather uh, traveled with all these people as well at the same time period, coming from the very same place at Montreal, Paris, Montreal, and his name was uh, Fred Dupree. Uh, he's the first inductee into the National Bison Association for Saving the Buffalo, and uh, yes, I did say that in Pierre because he, uh, he lived a whole generation before Scotty Phillip got to America. But Scotty was our neighbor to the south and uh, up here. And, and so uh, the buffalo, uh, his estate was settled and the buffalo went to Scotty Phillip, uh, then to Custer State Park and then spread you know, from there. So this is what Marcella really liked to talk about with some of the, the older um, history here. So we got the Dawes Act and um, next section here, education. She went to the boarding school, uh, nurses training here, and then later she even got an honorary doctorate degree from South Dakota State University in Brookings in public service. And I'll go into this. I, I went to the other one before to talk more about her family. But this is some of the early roots here for her community up there. It's, um, this is a nearby community of Whitehorse. And so uh, this was kind of rediscovered a few years ago, a Whitehorse winter count, which is from the year 1789 to 1915, which records the most important event of the year of the people, starting in the middle usually, and they work out to the outer part. And so some of the interpretation of this was lost or misplaced, and then it was, re it was found again. Uh, so that's a very uh, valuable recording of our history. And yeah, look at the year, 1789. That's, that's pretty old for our area. And, and uh, like I told her, there's, uh, there's two entries of my grandfather on there um, in the drawing. One of them is, well, they're both for Chief Hump. And one of them is his uh, trip to Washington to actually oppose allotment. He said, it's a land grab, you know, and don't, don't do it, don't sign it, you know. And uh, anyway, it happened. The other entry is, uh, I believe, was his, uh, his death was also recorded as the most important event of the year. And our family feather of the humps and crazy horse was a red tail hawk feather. And on, on this um, mural, they, they clearly drew a, a red tail hawk, you know, with that. So another uh, person here then, uh, this is from Marcella's uh, family here, this is Forbear. So Forbear was Ohoya Numpa, that's the way that is, Numpa, the word too, born 1834, a uh, Fool Soldier Band member. So he was part of the Fool Soldier Band that interacted and traded for captives, and that comes from the 
from the Shitak captives in uh, Minnesota following the 1862 Minnesota conflict there, and then the captives that were taken by a kind of an outlaw uh, band of, of native people, and they made a, a trade for them and helped those and saved the captives. So another link through all of that, like from, they talk about, there's a monument up in Mobridge uh, in the city park, you know, uh, commemorating that. So the fool, fool soldiers were a very uh, bunch of uh, young young warriors who uh, who bartered and they even gave up their own clothing and uh, very cold winter, you know, a lot of snow on the ground. And then when they got down about uh, towards uh, Gettysburg area on the east bank of the river, uh, they had got word further down to the mouth of Cherry Creek where uh, Fred Dupree, my grandfather, was. And uh, he arranged for a, a wagon to come up, and and then they moved uh, some of the fool soldiers into his residence there, which was kind of a conglomeration of uh, little log cabins on his place. Uh, and then eventually they came back down through here to the Fort Pier area, and then back to, and re were reunited with their families, who were very surprised. They thought they were long gone, you know forever and uh, so anyway fool soldier band is uh, is kind of a big question mark a lot of people don't realize what their importance was so forebear signed the Fort Laramie 1868 treaty as I mentioned and he's listed as a Oglala so that that was another thing you know we Marcel and I we kind of nudge each other and you know and and she's shaking her head nope <laughs> so she she likes uh, liked her history and 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 liked the accuracy of of history and that was instilled in her uh, early as well too. So he started Four Bear Camp, which was really a fur trading post as well. Uh, most of these communities would would like the schools that would evolve would go into the. Uh, present like Timberlake School District up in that regions for uh, geography anyway. Um, and here's Anton Lebeau, um, also a trader. And so a lot used to talk a lot about, you know, uh, Everts and Lebeau and uh, the whole story of uh, the allotment again and farming and cattle. And we talked about the uh, things like the six mile strip that was uh, fenced there that was uh, for putting cattle in there and, and grazing. Some of the, the grass was like two feet tall. And these big cattle companies were just thriving, thriving. And it was a time period before fences, so they built, put fences up. And everybody says, wow, six miles long. I can't imagine that. But get this, the, the length of it was about 89 miles long of fence. And then it, the width was six miles. So then at the end, it came up to the Missouri River there, and then they, uh, the railroad took them into Chicago, where LeBeau became the largest cattle export point in the, in the entire country. So some of that land goes right across uh, my uh, family's land, um, and some of the fencing is still there, which is... A pretty interesting thing. I haven't talked to anybody. I, I talked to Jim Nelson one time at the Timberlake Historical Society, and he thought that'd be a good thing to save some of that wire, you know, from the from there. But um, there's there's some in the family there, and it it runs ref, roughly where where my family is and relatives is through the uh, to the west, clear out to Thunder Butte. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of all these suburbs like Glad Valley and Meadow and places like that, but maybe maybe this one here where it's supposed a uh, legend where the mauling took place of uh, Hugh Glass is right out in there, uh, Shade Hill Dam. So that general area south of generally Lemon, South Dakota, that's how far uh, west I'm talking about that this this fence ran. So um, Antone was uh, very instrumental in starting 
all of that. Um, the, then this is her grandmother's connection is to the Hunk Papa. So uh, he was a participant in the Battle of the Little Bighorn and very uh, flamboyant and well-known warrior. Now, these people are veterans too. We honor them as veterans, see? But um, the, sometimes the other side looks at them kind of differently, you know? But they, they are our veterans, just like those from World War I and World War II. And, and one of the, the, the really, I think, is one of the really important uh, statistics is that 50% of American Indians are veterans of U.S. wars. And there isn't any ethnic group in America that comes close to that. But they proudly served, you know, in all the wars, clear back to uh, Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders and World War I, World War II, and then a lot of the uh, rights, too, uh, that were mentioned earlier uh, came about because of that. Well, women got the right to vote. 1920, uh, American Indian citizenship didn't happen until 1924, four years later, uh, after many who had served in World War I. And then uh, the 1968 Indian Civil Rights Act, uh, a late, late date. <laughs> Some of my students, when we're talking about religion and uh, that, and they'll say, well, when, when did American Indians, you know, uh, get their religious freedom then? So, I think, well, 18, well, they'll be guessing. And I'll say, uh, 1978. That's like yesterday. <laughs> and also with that was the Indian Child Welfare Act that went along with that. This is uh, another flamboyant uh, character from... Uh, Marcella's family, her Lekshi uncle, uh, born 1889, Armstrong Forbear. So uh, he was also a decorated World War II veteran, a trick roper. He participated in a lot of uh, rodeo and that. And uh, this is from one of my photo books. It's a, it's a Kundal photo, Frank Kundal from a uh, re really good photographer. So uh, a lot of people, I know they thought that was me right away when you seen that rope. But he did a lot of funny things with uh, rope. And then the more I learned about him, he kind of uh, carved out a place uh, like with, with Marcella in France because he was over there and he was, uh, it was documented how he could run and dodge. And he was out running uh, like a machine gun fire in a zigzag pattern. And so he's, he's zigzagging all around in northern France there, and I'm thinking, wow. And then Marcella comes through later, you know. Very much a family fair going on there. So then we get into some of the uh, history and the pictures here. Uh, 1943 was when she joined the uh, Army Nurse Corps. The 76th uh, General Hospital Unit. Um, in France and Belgium. And then also I've been over to these areas myself, so it was, it's interesting to connect and uh, kind of get a feel for those uh, pictures. Uh, let's see, this here on the right is uh, Normandy arriving there. And, and then also on the bottom is, bottom right, is the, uh, also Normandy, thank you. And the next one, um, see, I'm not sure if I can do that with this one. On the top is some bunkers, there's a gun in there. And so, as most of you know, the, uh, it was very rough arriving on the beach there. And there were five, five different beaches, and Marcella came in on Utah Beach. And this, this whole area, too, a lot of this over, over in the Arden uh, forest that I've been, th I've been through there was also uh, a real challenge in World War I, and uh, the Germans were known for, um, for trying to take that particular area in the later uh, what would be known as the Battle of the Bulge, which Marcella was also in. 
So then we have a, a, a map there. Can we go back to that map. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's actually uh, reversed from what I thought it was. But anyway, that's the area of uh, France, uh, Germany, and Belgium. So these are just some of the, the maps if you want to pull up uh, each one of those one at a time. She is on the front lines in a 1,000 tent hospital. It took her uh, about 12 or 13 days going by ship over there. Um, they, they came in to like Liverpool, England, and, and then over um, uh, to this area here. So these areas here on, on the left, does that one pop up? Anyway, that's some of the lines there. So you got uh, the, the Germans on, on the right side there, that's showing their movements in, into the Battle of the Bulge area. The Arden Forest there. And so I've, I've been through that forest, um, and it's, it's very large, encompassing. And then the Bulge itself is a round area. Where, where that gets its name, and then there's a kind of a hump in there, and that's where the bulge name comes from. And the areas that I was in over there, too, was over at uh, Wiesbaden, Germany, the uh, U.S. Army base there, and then Ramstein, just down the road, is uh, Air Force going towards that area. And then I was also in uh, Cologne, uh, Germany. So I seen a lot of the... Uh, you know, the after effects, and of course a lot of that's been rebuilt, but like uh, Kowloon was, was pretty much leveled. It's hard to imagine it today, such a beautiful uh, city. Uh, so from, from Kowloon over to where Marcella was is, is, is about for probably uh, 40 minutes. And she was at the community of, uh, it's, it's uh, Liege. Liège is L-I-E-G-E, -E, Liège, uh, Belgium. That's where the Thousand Tent Hospital uh, was. And uh, one bomb did hit her hospital in Liège, and 25 men died as a result of that. They were told to, uh, to, to be packed and ready to move at, any, at a moment's notice, but they didn't tell them why but it was because of the pressure that the, the Germans were putting on. So uh, she said in one of her quotes from, I got some newspaper quotes here, that it was the greatest honor of her life was, was just to serve when they ask about all of that. So the five beaches there then, she was at uh, Utah Beach, which is the westernmost, and then, of course, Omaha Beach, Juno Beach, Sword Beach, and, and Gold Beach were all where many lives were, were lost. Uh, I also you know, have some of the numbers, which some of you are probably uh, familiar with, with that. But uh, there were 150,000 uh, allies at, at Normandy, and you had the U.S., U.K., and Canada as part of that. Well, I was looking something up with all these video. There's these video clips on YouTube and that. Here, I, I pulled up one, one clip, a real nice historic one. It was Time Magazine. I looked, well, who did this? It was this Olivia Waxman. And just last fall, uh, she interviewed me, or last November, for Time Magazine. I said, I know that name. Um, and it was about American Indian veterans and some of the things that I talk about today. And what was I doing in, uh, at Wiesbaden and uh, those places, also at the University of Frankfurt? I was talking about American Indian participation in the wars and not the, our veterans from the U.S. wars, but also earlier ones as well. So this all started out, I guess, in, in my career uh, when I spoke at, um, uh, over at the DOD, 
It's now the U.S. Defense Logistics Information Systems in Battle Creek, Michigan, and, and then over to Fort Knox. I was a keynote speaker there. And then at the University of Frankfurt, um, I was a speaker over there as well. And that was Eisen, at that time then, Eisenhower is later, you know, the cleanup part of this. But I actually uh, seen a room there on the campus at the University of Frankfurt, which was uh, President uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower's uh, command headquarters for the Allied forces over there. Uh, and also, just looking out the window of the classroom, there there was a, um, you could go online and see this, but there was a, a huge bomb that, that was discovered in some of the additions that was built on. They had to evacuate, I think, three, three-fourths of Frankfurt, a very large city, and, and that's where I, I flew into. So this shows some of the uh, movement here. And this is the, uh, the Arden County uh, counter offensive here. So um, they were kind of an disadvantage the Germans were with the tanks as far as the, the, the wooded area. But this had been attempted in World War I as well, but they were overcome. We've got, uh, of course, they call that the wedge also, the Battle of the Bulge and Antwerp. Um, some of the other people here, Eisenhower, Patton, Churchill from the Allied Forces, uh, Jurd von Runsted, Hassel, are uh, other names from that. And then finally, that last one was just a map, and I've already kind of told you the, the areas of, uh, of Germany from Cologne and all that. So... Uh, with Marcella, she also, once she returned to Cheyenne River, um, of course, the marriage to, um, to, to her um, husband, Gib LeBeau, five daughters uh, th and three sons, Jerry, Diane, Kathy, Donna, Cynthia, Bonnie, Tom, Daniel, and Richard. And upon her marriage, uh, her father presented her with her mother's sewing machine. And she became very uh, adept at sewing and a seamstress and measuring dresses. And so eventually later, when she was 89 years old, she opens a business with her granddaughter, Bonnie, a sewing business. So uh, I'm thinking, wow, very energetic. She participated as a parent involved with school, the children's school and 4-H. Uh, Marcella and I spoke at a lot of uh, Native American Day uh, observances up in that area, uh, Timberlake schools and things like that. And they have some on video, too. I, I forgot they were videotaping some of that. And uh, I was told as I got prepared for this that there was some video as well. So uh, let's see here. Then the Chan, Chan Li Coalition for six years, that's a, uh, a smoke-free environment act. Um, so she was an advocate for that, which that came out in 2015 with also a video of that. And in 1992 and 95, Marcella and her son Richard went to Glasgow, Scotland uh, for a repatriation of a ghost dance shirt, which was from the Wounded Knee Massacre. Um, and she was also a, uh, uh, a District 5 Cheyenne River Tribal Council Rep, Director of Nursing at uh, IHS Eagle Butte. So she had a, a lot of years in, in each one. There's the, her sewing business, and then... The induction in November was National uh, Native American Hall of Fame. She's also a member of the of the South Dakota Hall of Fame, and I I had all I've got all of her awards as part of this too, and all of my sources. But just her awards alone would have taken all of this time. So I thought, well, I could just read all of her awards, and there's the program. <laughs> so I wanted to throw in some other stuff too. So um, she passed uh, on November 21st, and 
um, buried at St. Mary's Episcopal Cemetery in, in Promise. Promise comes from John Promise, who was a, um, a minister, um, that name. Uh, these are just some, uh, she was also, in uh, 2015, she was up at Standing Rock, and they did a 20-minute honoring for her upon the occasion when uh, President Obama and First Lady Michelle Obama visited the, the big city of Cannonball, North Dakota, on the Standing Rock Reservation. So those pictures are down there. That's Marcella. Uh, and uh, David Gipp is uh, president of the United Tribes. He was a uh, president up there. And then the others are some of my sources. I, I wrote a lot about all these people in Marcella's family in that Timberlake uh, history book up there. And then the other books are some of mine, historic photo books, and some of the, the photos come from that. Um, but the, um, let's see, in there, she also did a letter of support for the tribe um, and that was regarding uh, tribal health checkpoints on the reservation during COVID. She was a very much a, an advocate for that. Um, and, and I did find out of, an, of a new award that she just received like uh, days ago. So these awards are going to have not uh, stopped. Uh, let's see, that one is... Um, from the South Dakota Department of, of Health Champion Award, let's see, uh, Tobacco Prevention. And two of my favorite quotes from Marcella, from talking to her, were, uh, whoever thought a little girl from Promise would be honored in this way. Very humble person. And the other quote was, uh, I think she even made that in her plea about the checkpoints on the reservation, but life is so precious. Make the most of every day. So every day she had some kind of a idea or plan. So I do have 21 sources here that I listed are mainly uh, newspapers in the area of Cheyenne River, uh, Timberlake Topic, uh, even Rapid City Journal, West River Eagle, the White Horse Winter Count, Frank Kondo, uh, Jerry LeBeau, daughter of uh, Marcella, who I talked to, Associated Press, um, and, and then there's just so much more that you can say about her, her various awards that she had there. I'm just going to kind of scan over a couple things here. Uh, yeah, all of her um, family, very well known. And she was very adamant about accurate accuracy, too, with tribal history. And she was part of the Remove the Stain Act, which is uh, calling for the uh, recalling medals that were given to Wounded Knee soldiers in 1890. So she was a, a big part of that. The, the Ghost Dance shirt from Scotland is here in Pier at the Heritage Center, as far as I know it's still, still here. Uh, and I also uh, manage the archives at the tribe, Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe, so I was aware of a lot of, lot of resources out there uh, with her. Um, and so, I guess it's backing up now. There's a picture of of uh, me and Marcella, or recent picture like, and never forget her when I see a car pull up. This was at the Eagle Butte Cultural Center. Nice backdrop there, and a car pulls up, and I'm kind of looking, and I'm, I was waiting there for something, and next thing I, first thing I see is Marcella getting out, all big smile on her face, and just she's coming on a on a, almost a run, you know, a trot to talk history and that, and look at photos and talk about you know family, and and so I I think we we talked more about the older the older history and some of her family than we actually did with the with the, her actual service in the war. So I didn't 
always, you know, out of respect, I didn't just go out and ask her about certain things, but she would tell me, like, the story of Mr. Uh, Rubidoux, who was uh, from Rosebud, was a double amputee, and how they had connected uh, later in life, and then she remem remembered him, you know, back in the day at, at Belgium. And so she has those those memories as well, but I think, you know, it's always good to let them talk about that stuff, you know, when, when they're ready. So she's buried at St. Mary's uh, Episcopal Church in Promise. And with that, uh, I guess, I don't know if there's any time for questions. Yeah, we have a little bit of time for questions. So okay. if, does anyone have anything for? Yes. Let, I'll bring the mic to you. So I taught school in Eagle Butte for like 36 years. So I knew her and I knew her kids and she was a wonderful person. Well, thank you for your comments. What was your name? Peter Cass. Okay. Peter Cass. Thank you. Nice comments. Anybody else? Yes. I've often wondered why Plains people and a lot of the other native people their, la their names are always translated into English, and we never translate Japanese or German. My name would be, I think, head of grain if I were translated into the German and turned into English. But why do we not use Lakota, Dakota names in the Lakota, Dakota language? Well, that's a very good question. They they have, uh, you know, school resource packets that they use and try to encourage for Lakota language. And, and even in my books that were pictured up there, photo books, I used all Lakota um, language for the chapter headings and then in parenthesis. Uh, but a lot of them, too, were, were shortened, say, like, Wigmuki Washte We. Washtewi is a pretty rainbow woman. And sometimes names were, were altered or often shortened to almost unrecognized from the original meaning. Or, and some of that was because they didn't want an agent or somebody didn't want to write all this name down. He didn't want to write down uh, the man whose horses his enemies are afraid of and you come up with, well, I'm not going to write that down every time. So uh, then today, some of the families use young man, just young man. Or in the old days, you know, the was recognized as the old man afraid of his horse and the young man afraid of his horse. My own is uh, Chunkahu Wakantaya, translates to high backbone, and it's uh, the original name for the hump family of the humps. And so it's where the buffalo gets his power and strength. So we all, we know our own uh, names and languages and backgrounds. And so I, I could uh, also close with this, our uh, Lakota bands then we talked about. Okay, we got Ogallala, Pine Ridge. We got Sichangu, also known as Brule by the French, but it's Sichangu. Rosebud and Lower Brule located. We got Hunk Papa, Standing Rock. We got Minikoju, Itazipcho, Uhuea Numpa, Siha Sapa. Now that's the nation, that's the seven bands in Lakota. So now we're gonna have a test over the seven, <laughs> I just said. So get your paper out and, oh. Probably better known as brulee, transferred, burnt thigh, siha sapa, black feet. Yes. So, uh, do you have an, any idea of, like, the um, proximate date that Anton LeBeau would have come to South Dakota? Um, they usually give two dates for him, uh, two different uh, beliefs ab about that, and a lot of times that wasn't always um, 
conveyed or recorded, you know, some mm -hmm. fur trader guy has opened up here. But <clears throat> born in 1830 in France, about 1847 married uh, Mary Little Thunder, uh, also known as Si Changu, there's that name, Si Changu Wi, a burnt thigh woman. And, but she was Uhuayanupa. Uh, then we've got 1872, Antone moving up the Missouri River to the east side, uh, landing in 1883, Walworth County organized, quarter section of land purchased. Uh, yeah, but I have seen two, two dates that are about, uh, about five years apart. But, so uh, he met, the lady he married would have been in Iowa? Maybe he met her in Iowa? Um, 1847. 1847. She's from the Uhuaya Nupa, um, which would suggest Dakota Territory. Okay. And then um, uh, Marcella's last name was LeBeau. Did she marry a LeBeau? as well as being a Lebo? Uh, her her uh, name was Ryan. Her parents, uh, uh, let's one. see, back here. Joseph Ryan, R-Y-A-N, and her mother's Florence Forbear uh, Ryan. Father was Irish American and her mother was from Ohoya Um And then Louise Bareface, that side of the family is, is where the, um, that, that comes in on the, on the forebear side. Thank you. Yes. Okay, we have time for one more question. Going back to the naming, um, can you tell us a little bit about what a name-giving ceremony is like? Well, um, a name-giving is, is usually uh, decided upon for them in the, in the old days. They could have several names during uh, their lifetime, uh, occurrence at birth or something, and then later they may have two or three others given, often family names follow mine follows a family line of the last name and and mine uh, has to be earned and uh, so the, you can't just get that name and so others could be like a firstborn you know uh, the firstborn child or, or something like that uh, Marcella talked about you know no ceremony then because of the times so um, when I got my name, you know, I had I had that with my uh, like bare feet, you know, to the uh, to the, the the ground part, you know, and and then uh, honoring and uh, feathers and whatever, you know, gifts, um, whatever. Uh, there, I could give one example too of different stages in your life where people uh, say like a, a woman. Uh, when she becomes a woman, one of my family members, um, but, but the year leading up to that, he made all kind. Of, he made a teepee and different items, articles of clothing, and then on on her day, then she got a new name and she got all the belongings there as part of the ceremony, and so that's a day she'll always remember. I know some people today they like to do that in the powwow at our, say, our reservation, Labor Day powwow, and they announce it to the whole community. And I know I told my parents, I said, well, uh, I, I don't know if I want to go through that whole part, you know, and my mother said, well, you can do it anywhere. She said, you can call on the creator anywhere. She was a medicine woman. And so we just, she said, they, those can be done right in your backyard if you want to. So mine was more simple and some of my other family were more announcing it out, you know, elaborate. And uh, one thing too, when I talk about family too, I, I, to some extent I raised myself. So I have different people I call father and mother, but I, I would like to acknowledge my, 
my biologic father, also um, Donald Dean Vance, uh, who was in World War II uh, as well. Uh, so Marcella and him knew each other, and he served in World War II. He died two years ago at age 84, I believe it was. And uh, so anyway, I know one of his favorite stories was that he was, uh, I thought he was the first person from South Dakota to know that the Japanese had surrendered during World War II. So he was in the Navy and uh, getting messages, and the message came like in a lights, I guess, they, and uh, here they translated it out or whatever. And he told his uh, officer then, commanding officer that, what it said, they said, well, the Japanese have surrendered, and you know, he's, he was told to go back and resend, all, do all that one more time, because they could not announce something like that unless they knew positively, and they came back a second time, and then his, his ship uh, knew that then from them, U.S. Navy. Thank you so much. Uh, we are going to break now, so please go get some coffee, some water, talk to vendors, take advantage of a little bit extra time to talk to our speakers one-on-one, -on -one. Uh, even if they don't want to, just you know, go up to them. And uh, we'll be back here at 3. And Pilamia, thank you.